think outside the box, if you will. I mean, go there, go off campus. Let's think this through. And sure enough, that's where the Mustang was born. When it finally hit, it took the country by storm. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Cars in Context. I'm your host, John Clore. You know, this is the Motor City, and this is the show where we put cars into the context of your everyday life. We'll try to give you some information and entertainment, but we will make no apologies for our decidedly Detroit perspective. And speaking of a Detroit perspective today, we've got a great show for everyone in the family. So pull up the chair, uh, pop some popcorn. We're going to be talking about female driver. And, you know, we always talked about female drivers before. There's a lot of cheering going on in the audience when we talk about that because we know that it's always been the battle of the sexes when it comes to the automobile. But in Detroit, we have some historic news, and that is that a female will be driving General Motors. They'll be the, uh, the new CEO of General Motors. The glass ceiling, if you will, in the automobile industry has been shattered. And we're going to talk about that with none other than one of our favorite guests, Joe Babiaz. John, Joe, good to see you again. Welcome to the show again. How are you? You know, folks, you, uh, you've seen Joe before. Uh, Joe is our, our resident expert, and uh, he's a good, great automotive historian, a GM kind of guy. He's got a good GM history. We're going to get inside the, the, what it really means, what the impact of that hire at General Motors will, and what it's going to mean for the future of GM in just a minute. But first, let's find out what's in the news. Uh, this first item, folks, I, we've been talking about this on Cars in Context for a long time, and this is great news. China has going, is going to cancel all those import tariffs they have on U.S. cars. That is fantastic news because we're going to be selling a lot of new cars in China now. And I, I'll take you back into when we used to talk about this on our show a couple of years ago. China had imposed huge tariffs on any car that was imported to China from the United States of America if it had an engine larger than two and a half liters. And, uh, and that was in retaliation, actually. Uh, the, the whole thing was just a way to get back at the U.S. because we had imposed tariffs on tires made in China because what the Chinese government did is they invested heavily in the tire industry over there. And you recall they made so many Chinese tires and then dumped them in the U.S. market at such a low price that the regular tire producers could not compete with that low price. And therefore, the Chinese like bought in 40% of the tire market instantly. And to, to say, well, you can't just dump tires here. You have to be competitive. We put a tariff on the tires to make them more competitive. Well, the reaction was, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll put a tariff an import duty on all your cars. Well, guess what, folks? It's gone. The Ministry of Commerce recently decided to just let them expire because none of the Chinese automakers complained, saying, well, fine, they can, they can bring their cars in. So this is going to be great news, Joe, for uh, cars like the Jeep Wrangler sells a lot in China and the new Ford Mustang is going to be exported to China. Right. Right. This is really great news that they're going to stop this, this battle and understand we were not, we're not dumping cars there. We're not subsidizing, because of the bailout, they thought we were subsidizing the industry. And this is a great thing to get over. Yeah, it's great. Why don't There's you take one? Cars yeah, uh, go was Government Motors really a net loss? I know we've we've oh, talked boy. about it. You know, uh, <sighs> the U.S. government is finally out of General Motors. They sold all the remaining shares. Yep. Um, and so the, the term Government Motors is no more. It is at its own its own company. And, and by the way, doing really well. There's, their, their stock is over $40 a share. Plants are the humming. The product line is, is the best second is, to yeah, none. And the I plants mean, are humming. People the, are working, the, Joe. Yeah, people are, you know, people are gainfully employed. And for those people who, you know, there are a lot of people that think um, we, we should not have been bailed out General Motors. You know, I'm a pure capitalist, but this is, this is a case where it was the right thing to do. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Bush and Mr. Obama, for that, because it really saved us a lot of money. A million and a half jobs were saved. Although, you know, instead of paying unemployment benefits, right. we were pay, you know, people are paying taxes. Which is State, a social, local, federal Like a social taxes. insurance is unemployment. And not only that, folks, with these people, if they were all out of work, um, the, yeah, we, the, well, there was a, several hundred billion dollars. They thought, oh, and then we got most of it back. And, but that, the money that they didn't get back, they're far going to be repaid by maybe not spending it. Plus, the, the, the wages now are going to go into Social right. Security. And, and I think all that money's been repaid by now yeah, already. It, it, and it's just it's, it's, truly, it's a great deal for everybody. Truly a smart investment, although you'll hear people tell you, oh, that was so stupid, the government should get involved. And you know, guess what? In this particular instance, 
as GM goes, was, so goes the nation. It was one of those few things the government did well, I yeah. think. It's about yeah. the best way you can describe it. <laughs> the rest you of know, the time, and, and they, they we don't some, need them. They did some studies showing that the bailout actually prevented the loss of 100 and, $105 billion in social insurance tax collections. See, that's, so, you which know, is, we, which negates the difference. We saved so much money. Yeah. People are working. And, and the, you know, we talked, it's not just the big, uh, big three or, uh, or Chry uh, Chrysler and GM going out. But a lot of the suppliers would have gone out, oh, too, yeah. just as we're going to talk a little bit yeah. later about. Uh, You'll see how that so impacts us a little bit later. Great, great deal. Good news, folks. Good believe news. it or not, believe it or not, good news. A good one news all the way around. Now, speaking of uh, collapsing auto industries, uh, you remember on Cars in Context, we told you that Ford was going to back out of Australia and no longer build cars after a, a long history there, building great cars like the Aussie Falcon and you know some of those great Mad Max cars that we all love. And then General Motors just recently also said they're not going to be producing cars in Australia, and they're going to pull out of Australia market. Well, now, folks, you knew this was all going to happen. Right after those announcements of both Ford and GM, now the suppliers, they are on the bubble. They are so worried now. Without these two giants to supply these, this, this huge industry, if the industry goes away, what are they going to do? Well, where is their business going to come from? Well, Ward's Auto says that 75 percent, 75, three quarters of all the supplier companies in that nation will go out of business because of the exit, and the, country, the prime minister over there says that the government's going to have, a, have to get a plan to help not only the shuttered companies, but for the thousands of laid-off workers that work not only at the companies, but now at the suppliers as well. So transitioning them into other fields with training, Joe, that, uh, how's that, that doesn't going? always work. No. <laughs> the, there's, there's not necessarily other jobs out there. And exactly. It's, it's a sad thing that, that that Ford and General Motors have decided to uh, to leave Australia. Well, but it was it had to be a, a business decision that was best. And, and, well, and here's the, here's why, folks. In case you missed that Cars in Context show, the reason why is because they felt they could not make a profit based on the cost of building cars there. And the reason why Toyota is still there is because the yen, the devalued yen, allows them to make profit on on things that you'd think would be a loss over there. But here's the question, and here's the context that I love to bring out on this show. If the suppliers go out of business in Australia, will Toyota still be able to build cars there with no suppliers? Unlikely. There you're, so that is the whole scenario that wasn't played out here in America that nobody talks about. That's a huge problem. If we didn't bail out GM and Chrysler, let them fail, would Ford have to just go under because nobody would be able to afford to supply them and they don't have enough volume? I, I agree. Those are, those are the questions you expect to be asked, and they're not. And one other thing with the suppliers, a lot, a lot of times piece prices are based on volume. Sure. And so if we don't, if we can sell parts to Ford, uh, Ford, General Motors, and Toyota, right. I can sell you a starter for forty bucks. But now if I only do it for Toyota. Right. My cost basis is going to be sixty dollars. So now Toyota's prices are going to have to right. go. Right. And even if you can stay in business, if you the, can. the end product's going to go yep. up too. Absolutely. Great, great insight on that. So we're going to watch that very carefully. Yeah. See what happens to Toyota over there. Why don't you take another one, Joe? Uh, GM's next big need is its own finance company. You know, GM went during the bankruptcy. They they had to sell GMAC to get some cash. Wasn't GMC was, so and, profitable? And they were make, they were making money, but they they were forced to sell a company, and they are the only ones left that don't do, don't do in house right. financing. Right. And so really, we, they need to take a look at how they can get back into the finance business. It's a money making business. I mean, the the cost of borrowing is so low today for 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 corporations for anything. Yeah. That they can still go in. They can they can sell more product because right. they they can offer. A, 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 a good value in their uh, financing, right. make additional money on their financing line, sure. and everybody wins. It's a win-win. So Whether the, they will or not, I don't know. I'm sure they're looking at it. Well, instead of the banks making the money on those loans, GM can GM, make it. And GM was it making out. so much money on GMAC. Folks, if you were driving around Tyron, did you ever see those real estate signs, GMAC real estate? I mean, they got into other businesses. It was a money-making operation. They need that, especially yeah. if you do uh, like leases or fleet sales. You've got to have, you got to finance sure. that. So I hope... I, I bet you what in a few months GM will come up with a plan. They got to. I'm sure they'll. It may not be it. called GMAC, but it'll be called something. That's a, that's great good, news. Yeah, good news. Now here's a, our uh, for this last item. I just you know folks around here. I always like to th end the news with a little bit of a fun item. And so I'm going to ask folks about: do you, Has your car ever been damaged in a hailstorm? Now in Southeast Michigan, I think we're pretty lucky. We don't get hail damage that often, even when. You, you know, the skies look bad and we get small hail. It doesn't really dent up our cars. Western Michigan, uh, certain parts of the state, and then all over the other parts of the country have, have a hail problem. If, if you ever bought a used car and saw a bunch of dents on it, you wonder what that's from. It's usually a car that got stuck in a hail storm, right? Well, guess what, folks? What the hell's going on with this mm. new item? This guy, a guy in Texas, and the guy's name um, is Michael Siciano. 
he's come up with a really cool idea. He's going to sell you this. This is called the Hail Protector. Now, it comes in six different sizes, three for cars and three for trucks and SUVs. And then what happens? You put this over your car. It looks like a car cover, Joe, doesn't it? Just it like does. a plain car cover. Mm -hmm. But guess what, folks? If you put plug in the electric <laughs> blowers, that's what it's happens a, it's to it. It's a blimp. It's, John, a, it's a blimp. It's a, it's a giant <laughs> airbag for your car. It takes about 10 minutes to blow it up. Now, you think, well, wait a second. I've plugged it in my house, and here comes a hailstorm, and the power goes out. Well, if you put AA batteries in the electric motors, it can run for about an hour. Because if it's plugged in a house, it runs Double, Like, what, a thousand <laughs> double A batteries? Know. How many do you actually no. put in there? Yeah, that, that will, you can imagine now, it can hail as, as far as it wants. And look, it's so wow. protected, no hail stone, even a one or one and a half inch hail stone, is going to get mm. through that airbag, dent your car, and destroy it. Because, let's face it, folks, not everybody has a garage. I think it's a great idea. Um, if you want, it's if you're interested in this, and you've had a hail problem, you can go on to hailprotector.com. Uh, prices for this, Joe, about three to four hundred dollars, mm. depending on what size you. Have. And if you're in a hailstorm, you're going to pay a lot more unless your insurance covers it. You might have a deductible of five hundred dollars or something. Yeah, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Even to the get your dent car guy, those dent guys that come out to your the house, paintless dent. Yeah, dent they're, guys, they're, yeah, they're 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 what forty fifty dollars per dent. Yeah. And if you get a hailstorm, boy, you'll yeah. be paying more than four hundred bucks. I wonder if you can fill that with helium. Can you just kind of float? <laughs> Fly away, Mary yeah, Poppins yeah, style. Really. Okay, well, listen, we're going to come back and put Joe Babias here in the driver's seat with our topic of the day about female driving the head of General Motors, Mary Barra, being the new GM CEO, right after this. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Cars in Context. I'm your host, John Clore. Today, we're talking about the female driver, the biggest female driver in the world, the top one in the world. That's Mary Barra, who's the new CEO of General Motors. It was an earth-shattering announcement that General Motors would take this female to drive the top of their company, to, to take the automotive industry in a new direction. And Mary Barra is, is probably got, uh, I mean, there's been women at the top of great companies before, Hewlett Packard, eBay, have had the wonderful uh, lady CEOs, but this gal's got a real challenge today helping us sort this all out. Joe Babias, Joe, hey John. Again. Good to see you again. Joe, we love reading you on the Automotive Traveler. We, you know, your cars and context stuff is uh, riveting, and you, you've got uh, a lot of inside information and inside knowledge and, and experience with General Motors. We know about how, why car companies change CEOs, why sometimes a complete change of the guard and personalities is necessary. And so I'd like to get your spin. The glass ceiling has been shattered. The yeah, auto industry has. never had a female head of, uh, of a company ever before. This is big news. It is big news. This so is really what, what's big your news. initial take on this? Yeah, uh, I think it's, a, I think it's a, a great move by General Motors. Uh, you know, we, Mary's got a, a really deep background at General Motors. She's been there 33 years. Oh. Started out as a co-op student in 1980. Um, got, got her electrical engineering degree. Um, was a plant manager of Hamtramck. She's been around the block with the company, and you know, some, sometimes they'll they'll say, you know, should you hire from within? Should you get a fresh mm -hmm. a fresh face, as they did with with several other people in mm -hmm. the past? Um, but this is a case where I think this is the right person at the right time for this job. She comes with a, a, a very deep background uh, at General Motors. Um, the product line is great. She, I think, has that vision of where the company needs to go. And I'm really happy to see they chose her. I think she's going to do a wonderful job. Well, folks, you know, let's let's sort you through this because never before has this happened. And here's uh, a gal that's come up right through the ranks. There's reason. Right. There's a reason why people get promoted through male or female. It's tougher for women to get promoted through. They don't have the the legions of the good old boys network behind them. Right. So they have to earn their stripes in a different way than the, the typical male executive. But here's what's going to happen now. Um, with um, the, the outgoing CEO, Dan Ackerson, you know, what happened is his wife had contracted cancer and had a cancer diagnosis. And, and, and bless him for saying, you know what, 
I'm going to be with my wife during this difficult time. Uh, you know, General Motors, I've, I've given enough. This is time for the most important person in my life I'm going to take care of. You know, he's got enough money. He's got an, he, he could have retired any time he wanted to. But the, the fact is that he's led him out of the darkness. Uh, it's no longer Government Motors, as we've talked about. It's time for him to step down and to be with his wife. What a great move there on his part. And second of Absolutely. all, that, that he gives the, the helm to Mary. But uh, further down Mary's job, you know, and what, what happens down the, the ranks, is the CFO Dan Maman becomes president of the company. So GM's president will be Dan. Mark Rice takes over Barra's old job. She was uh, she product used to be the head of product development. Right, and purchasing. Yeah, and purchasing. Two huge parts of any automotive company is knowing product development and purchasing. The money and the cars. The cars coming down the pike. And then Alan Beatty gets Roos's former job as head of North American Ops, which is so... So what happens... This move, Joe, um, it comes at a time where the company still has those, all those people are just moving up a notch, and Mary could give them this fresh perspective. Um, the rumor within the company is that she has, um, or she has a, a known for ability to get things done. So rather than table them, go into committee, and things get stalled out, uh, Mary uh, wants to, what's going to happen with, you know, she stays on task. And she has this uh, everybody get along together kind of management style. Much like you know, your your mom would separate you in a in a fight with your siblings, much different than your father would. You know, your father was all you know, cut and dried. Who's in you know, who's in trouble? Mom would try to work things out. Right. And I think I think Mary, having a female at the head of the company, might really lend a whole new era of of, of cooperation between. Really, these are uh, factions that within a company you might not believe it. You're all on the same company on the same team, but. The bean counters are fighting you, the product guys are fighting you, the marketing guys are fighting you, and who's well, making you, you would think they'd be on the same team, but historically a lot of times they weren't. Divisions were against divisions, right. everybody fought for the same dollars. But, you know, I think Mary uh, in this position, she's the right person. GM's on a roll right now. I think this is, this is going to be the start, uh, you know, now that the, the government is out of, out of GM's uh, hair, You've got a new leader. You've got Mark Royce, you know, moving up the ranks. Some other ones who are great people at General Motors. Oh, yeah. And GM is just on a, on a tear right now. And you're going to see a lot of good things coming out of GM. All right, Joe, I don't want to do this to you, but I'm going to do it anyway because that's the way I am. I'm going to play the devil's advocate. Okay. And I'm going to talk about uh, the people that don't like the fact that Mary's in there. They say, this is same old, same old Detroit. You take somebody that's been in the company, not necessarily the fact that she's a woman, but the fact that she's in the company, she went up through the ranks, and you make it at the top. And that's why Detroit gets tunnel vision. You can't see the future. All those folks out there in, uh, in uh, California, oh, Detroit is old-fashioned. They don't know anything. This is why they like Ford. Ford went out and got Alan Mulally. He didn't know anything about cars. He was in charge of the Boeing from the West Coast. He's an airplane guy. It has nothing to do with the car business, and they put this not, this transplant into Ford, and he's been wildly successful there. So, what is the explanation? How do you how do you explain? Well, why wouldn't you do what Ford did? Go out and get somebody who's like from the peanut industry or some other industry, and put them in charge of General Motors. Well, I think it's it's never black and white. You know, you can't always say that if you bring somebody in from another industry, they will always succeed because clearly it's happened before. Oh yeah. And it, and a lot of companies have not succeeded. The key is to get the right person for that job at that time. Alan Mulally was the right person. Now Boeing, you know, you're building planes. That thing does a lot more than a car does. It goes up, down, it does a lot of different things. So he, he was a smart guy. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, he's a, he a smart guy. Mary is equally smart. And Mary's gonna be the right, is the right person for that job. And yes, some people will say we should have gotten, come from somewhere else, an outsider. <sighs> I think right now you do need that car person uh, who has a, the, the history of General Motors. And, and keep in mind, she was at GM when GM wasn't doing such a right, great job. Right. So she's, she was there and she saw it happen. <laughs> she lived through it. She right. survived it. She right. grew through it. So <laughs> I'm still convinced this is a good move. Don't, we don't want an outsider right <laughs> Let now. Let me explain why Joe is really, really, really right about this. Okay, it's like, uh, let's put it in other terms. It's like you were a Red Wings fan back during the Dead Wings era. You knew what it, what it took to rebuild that team to become a Stanley Cup champion. You were a Tigers fan back when they were not even contenders, when uh, when we had nobody. There was no stars. And now we're a contender. So you've, you've experienced and know right. your heart is there. You're, so there's a passion, which you need in the car business. You may not need uh, to have a passion to make uh, widgets. That, that You can just you know be a good businessman. But in the car business, if you don't have a feel and a passion, be a visionary for this, you'll never succeed. Why Malali? was so successful at Ford was because, as Joe said, it's timing. At the time at Ford, there were so many fiefdoms, there were so many people in that, in that era 
that um, were so entrenched and so many uh, different chimneys, if you will, of, of, of taking Ford into a new direction. You needed somebody from the outside that ho had no uh, alliances with anybody. Right. Didn't know anybody. So he's not going to play favorites. The old boys network at Ford had gotten so thick that it, it crumpled the company's ability to be visionary. So Mullally was the right guy. It may be that next time, now that he's uh, moving on, we, the rumors he's going on, yeah. and uh, it may be that the next guy at Ford would be someone from inside who's got a passion for product, who has a knowledge about the, the brand, Ford, uh, that can take it because truly an outsider cannot really do that forever. In this business, Joe, let's face it, cars are a different breed. You've got to, what did Henry Ford once say? If I asked people what they wanted, uh, they would just want a faster horse. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you've got to have a vision with a car company and to know that company, what it can do, you've got to know it from the inside out. Right. And, and I think and, Mary's and she knows it. She knows it. She's lived it for 33 years. Right. That's a long time with a company. I mean, people don't stay in companies 33 years anymore. So she's been through the, she's been through the fire. And again, I'm convinced we're going to see a lot of good things out of GM. We are seeing it. You see the auto show coming up shortly. You're going to see a lot of new products coming out. It's world class. Let's throw one more little uh, uh, iron into the fire here. Here's what a lot of people put this into context for the typical guy who thinks, oh no, that's going to really change General Motors and their products. Guys, here's what you don't know that your, your woman in your life, and even if you don't have a woman in your life, your ladies, women in general, actually influence more car sales than men. Yeah, they're about half the market, but guess what? The ones that are married or ha are in relationships, they influence your decision too. Believe it or not, Joe, it's really important to make sure the female buyer, the female customer is addressed, and by having a female at the top of the house, wow. That'll happen. That'll really happen. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're looking forward for good things. Of course, at Cars in Context, we'll, we'll track this for you. Joe, thanks for that insight. That was just... Hey. My Good stuff. Pleasure, John. But now it's time for one of my favorite parts of the show. And this is the part of the show where people have so much pride in their ride that they send us a picture and tell us about their car and we put it on the air. Today is a really, it's a much different Pride My Ride than ever before. Instead of an owner sending me a picture, I get a note from an old friend of mine, a guy named Jason Demchek, who lives in Royal Oak, who used to work with me at an agency in Dearborn, uh, PCG Campbell, a marketing and communications company that we worked together for a while. And Jason is now the performance com communications manager over at Ford Motor Company. So he has set pride in a news ride, and here's what he sent me. He sent me this picture of the 2015 wow. Ford Mustang, and he said, John, the guys over here at Ford have so much pride in this new ride. This is the all-new Mustang. What do you think? Put it on the air. We have so much pride in this. We can't wait till everyone comes out to the Detroit Auto Show to see the new Ford Mustang, the sixth generation. Jason, not a typical pride in your ride, but we'll take it, mm. folks. If you have pride in your ride and you want to see your car on the air, send it to me, jclore at carsincontext.com, and we'll put you on the air. But, Joe, you know there's more. There's always more. Yeah. I also have a favorite part of the show, and that's when people write in and give us their viewer mail. And we, we love this part of the segment because it's our chance to interact with our viewers. And so we'll ask Lauren Parrott. Lauren, is it possible that we have viewer mail for Cars in Context this week? Yeah, you always have mail. I it. hope so. How do we do it? Thank you so much, Lauren. You're welcome. This is awesome stuff, folks. This is the best time. And we're going to let Joe take this first letter from one of the viewers. Joe, go ahead. Okay, this one comes from uh, Lydia C. in Gross Point Shores, who watches Cars in Context on ATTUverse Channel 99. Okay. Uh, dear Joe, I love your Where's My Dipstick show <laughs> about how automakers are leaving things they deem unnecessary out of new cars. Yeah, that was a weird show. <laughs> and I'm so glad you mentioned that some automakers are not including spare tires. My husband recently right. bought me a new luxury SUV that cost over $50,000. I was shocked to find that a spare tire was not included. For $50,000? grand, you think you get a spare you tire. Or two, or three. <laughs> yeah, uh, can you tell right. me what the automakers think when they're supposed, what, what are we supposed to do yeah. if we get a blowout that cannot be made roadworthy with a tire inflator? So, so what do they put in the car now, Joe? They put a, a, a air, uh, an air, an air. Did you bring a picture? Do we have an air inflator? What, what are they showing in the trunk of these cars now? I mean, it's just I, like a, they take the wheel out. I mean, there's a, okay, there's a, yeah, it's just like a, is. it's like you plug it into what your yeah, cigarette it's lighter. An air, it's a, yeah, it's an air pump. So, and hopefully, now the thing is, if your tire went flat, it went flat for a reason. <laughs> I mean, you know, the pump is probably not going to help you very much if you have a if you have a nail in there or you've busted up the the, the wheel if you've broken the you know bent yeah, the so, wheel. Yeah. So what's that going to um, do? Or the sidewall, it's not going to do you any good. So that little you, pump, you can, oh, first of all, it's you, a lot smaller and it's a lot lighter. So is that it? It's not the cost. I mean, that obviously costs some money to make, right? True. So you're getting a little. So it's just the weight. 
Uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah. A huge they, tire, well, 20 inch you know, rim on an SUV. They, you know, the government's requiring, what, 53 miles to yeah, the gallon by 2025, something yeah, like that. Yeah. So they're looking at every way to uh, reduce mass. No, so, you know, but, so but for that, what good is it going to do you if you if you hit a pothole <laughs> and you've bent your wheel and you can pump till the, you know, till the cows come home, <laughs> Lydia, you're not going to fill up your tire. You better be calling AAA. That is a great question. So, Lydia, you're right. You, you, what are you supposed to do? I, what are you supposed to do? Is I have no answer for it. I don't know. You're I supposed to, guess, call your, your tow truck. If you have, you know. You're a, stuck. Yeah, you are, you're stuck right there. You so, call let that be a lesson to you folks. If you're going to buy a new car and you're really driving a hazardous area and you, you, if you had a flat or a blowout in the last couple of years and think you need a spare buy a car with a yeah. spare and you know maybe they should offer it as an option or maybe here's an answer go buy one on from the dealer and then throw it in your yeah. car yeah yeah don't know great question don't get a flat well i've got one here no here we go this one comes to us from bruna s and she lives in harper woods michigan and she watches cars in context on comcast cha channel 915 for you comcast viewers that means we're in hd and all our radiant beauty wow um, That's this was scary. I got a dear John letter from Bruna. She says, John, I totally agree with your show about the Etzel. Oh, I did a show with Jim Sawyer about the Etzel. Was the Etzel uh, really ugly and terrible, or was it just ahead of its time? That was our show. She said, my husband and I owned one back in 58. Oh, bless you. The coolest Etzel was a 58, and we loved the car, even though many people said we made a bad choice. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> yeah. She said, another car we liked but people thought was ugly was the Pontiac Aztec. Which I love. It's a, great, a great, great crossover. I love that car. Why isn't unique styling appreciated mm. by the, uh, the automotive experts? Uh, why isn't? Well, okay, Bruno, listen. It. Gee, that is you. That's a tough one. Yeah, well, mean, beauty it, is in the eye of the beholder. Personally, I like uh, the car like uh, the Kakia Soul and that Nissan Cube, these little funky boxes. You know, you see, I don't care for those. The, I, I, I don't you know. Yeah, I know that, you that wanna, is, it's unique, but it's If you want to stand out and be in those... People buy cars for different reasons, I guess, and styling is one of them. If you want to be funky and stick out from the crowd, you buy those cars. And if you don't, you if you want to blend in, you buy a car that like a, a silver or gray or beige Camry. And when you go to the parking lot with your, where's my car? There's, there's, there's eighty thousand. I, I love the fifty-eight. I love the. I, I, I do too. Was, it's on. It's part of Cars in car. Context logo. That car was yeah. taken out of context. A great question. Um, the, the answer is buy what you love. Not exactly. what other people tell you well, should buy. Put a smile on your face. Don't be a lemming, because uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I really think that 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 you, when you think about buying cars, buy your personality. Buy a car that you're proud to be in. But if if people laugh at you and make fun of you and say, well, listen, uh, it'll be a collector's item someday. Someday. Yeah, exactly. They all will, right? They are, <laughs> yeah. uh, they're and, worth a million dollars. Well, the question is that, it. Joe. Will they all? Some of them that are um, just plain Jane, no nothing cars. We'll never, never be, be worth, a collector's item. No, they'll never so be bless you. We can do a show on that, by the way, because I've done studies about buying collector cars and you know Which, buy what you want. But as an example, mm. if you want a '50 Plymouth two-door, you can buy. You can load them up for four or five, six thousand dollars. But if you want a '49 or '50 Ford, yeah. you're paying a lot more for it. That's so, a great. Well, folks, the, see this letter to us uh, is going to is going to spark the show. We're going to do a show on that. Thank you for your mail. If you have a question you'd like answered on the air, send it to me, jclore at carsandcontext.com, and we'll give your viewer mail a shot. Joe, again, we're out of time. Thanks thank for joining us. My pleasure, John. And it was Good really great you having you. We'll, we'll do another one soon. And, folks, uh, thank you for joining us. And please try to remember until next time that knowledge is power. I'm your host, John Clore. Thanks for watching.